You know, every, every week I feel like I say to everybody, it's, it's good to have everybody here, but I, I hope you know, like I, I mean it. Like I, I'm blown away all the time, like what a joy it is to shepherd this church. And uh, this week it's been so much fun. I've seen different ones of you even. I'm seeing out there your faces right now. As I've been like out and about town, whether I'm eating or at the gym, which those two go really well together, don't they? Um, but just such a reminder, I, I love this church and, and I'm so excited to go through the book of Isaiah. I hope last week opened your eyes a little bit to this amazing book because it really is. It is a literary masterpiece that I think when we get done with it in these next several weeks, none of us are gonna be the same because of our time that we've spent there. But last week what we did is I tried to open up for you just this idea, most importantly, that this, this is a vision. It's, it's, and again, when, it, you, when you look at it, it's not visions, but it's a vision. It's a, it's a compilation. It's an anthology of all the sermons that Isaiah preached. And when he preached all these sermons, at the very end of his life, he felt the need to put them together. So they're, they're not necessarily chronological, but they're trying to show something. He's trying to make sure people understand because the idea of a vision is we don't see life like we need to. And unless God steps in and shows us reality, we are going to have a tendency to keep on and continue to be deceived. Every one of us in here, make sure you hear me on this. The Bible is so crystal clear. All of us are either being deceived, are being deceived, will be deceived, have been deceived. We just struggle seeing reality. And the beauty of this concept of a vision that Isaiah grants to them is, I will help you now because I have encountered the living God. He has conveyed to us a message so you can understand reality. So that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be taking a lot of time to understand reality. And one of the things that I hope you caught from last week, and it's something that I always try to convey over and over again, never ever forget who you are as God's children. Because I believe one of the biggest things that Satan tries to do is to get you to believe something other than who you are, if you're a follower of Jesus, as a son or daughter of the King Most High. Never forget that. And Isaiah is going to not only grant us this grand vision, this grandiose understanding of who God is, but he's also going to remind us of who we are in light of this great God. Now, saying that, and we talked about last week, this is our time. It happened to them back in the, before the cross. We now live after the cross, but don't miss this. It is now our time so that we need to understand and ask what is going to keep us from really being the people God intends us to be? Now, what we're going to do in looking at this, because I think Isaiah does this for us, is he's going to lay out what the problem is. And so you're going to see this in this text, that there's this idea of a problem that we're facing. You're going to see that in, in chapter 1, verses 2 through 9, and then in 11 through 15. But the, the beauty of it is, is praise God, there's the solution, uh, verse 10, and then verses 16 through 18. And then finally, though, and this is what's always the case every time we study the Bible, there will be a decision to make. So we're going to see the problem. So we can just kind of get it wrapped around our heads, the problem, the solution, and the decision. That's kind of what we're going to be working through. So what's the problem? Well, when you look at verse 2, here's how he opens it up. Here's the problem that we're facing. He says, hear, O heavens, and I love this, and give ear, O earth. For the Lord has spoken, children have I reared and brought up, but they've rebelled against me. Now, the, the idea is, especially off the front end, those first words are to shock us. He's, he's calling into account. I don't know if you've ever been wronged before, but you're trying to find witnesses, right? You're in these finding of witnesses. You're like, no, 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 come listen to this. Come hear this. And so in God's case, he can't call anyone else to witness. So he calls heaven and earth. He says, come and see what I'm talking about in this idea of rebellion. Now, we don't know what the rebellion is yet. We're going to talk about that here in just a second. But somewhere in this rebellion is, is tied to this idea of children. And he uses these two words, reared and brought up. Now, those two words in Hebrew are important for where we're going in this. So you've got to grasp this. I really want to try to convey it to you so you understand what the problem is. 
To be reared or brought up isn't just like a raising children thing, but each of those words convey this idea of God lifting us to a holy place, lifting us to an elevated status. Again, not because of anything in us, not because we're so special, but his point is, is that my people in humanity, those created in the image of God, my people, my children, I have set aside and I have elevated them. This is what I'm talking about. Don't forget who you are. Now, we're tied not because we're great innately in and of ourselves or, or in any kind of a way, but we are great because God is great. He's conveying this idea when I keep, when I say to you, never forget who you are. This is the shock of God is that in all of humanity, I've chosen a group of people to be mine. Now, just imagine this, and they've rebelled against me. Now, in my particular family, my wife and I weren't able to have children, and so we, we adopted our children, which was a, such an awesome path for us to go. But to get this idea of the shock and the horror, our children, we, we wanted them into our family. Of, of all the kids, God and his grace brought these kids to us. We brought them into our family. They became our little kiddos, even though probably, you know, sometimes they wonder, why in the world, God, did you give me these parents? But, you know, that's, that's okay. That's just their lot in life. But there's just this side of it right there, mine. But all of us know the story of kids. At some point, even these parents that love them, that adore them, that care for them, and we are not perfect parents, but God, the perfect father, watched as children rejected him. So don't hear everything I'm about to say as a God that's sitting there railing against you, coming in, trying to tell you what's up. This is a heart-wrenching cry from heaven, absolutely blown away that he had chose them and made them beautiful, and yet still in the midst of it, they rebelled against him. Now, what is it then we need to learn? In this problem that we're facing, and you're going to watch all of chapter one do this, it becomes this downward spiral. The first step that moves us towards the great problem of rejecting God or rebelling against him, the first step is forgetting who you are. The moment that you and I forget the greatness and the grandness, if we're followers of Jesus, of what it means to be called to him, it is the first step in a many series of steps, a downward spiral towards this idea of rebellion. That's the problem. Now, for some of you sitting there, you're like, I don't know what you're talking about, rebellious. Even for me, like sometimes I sit there and I'm like, oh, I'm not very rebellious. Now, I'm so glad that in the back of your head you're asking that because that's exactly what Israel was asking. In fact, as he's sitting there teaching them, they're like, what are you talking about? We're not rebellious. In fact, one of the things that's so interesting, if you've ever noticed people, is that often we don't think of ourselves as rebellious or something that we've rejected God or that somehow we're offended or that God is offended by us. In fact, in our culture, we're offended by God. All the time I'll hear people say this, you know, you know, God's going to kind of hear it anyway, so I'm just going to be offended by God. He knows how angry I'm at him. Now just stop and think about that for a second. I understand what people are trying to say there. But do you honestly think any of you would be offended by God if suddenly in Isaiah 6 we were rushed into the throne room of God? This offense is not ours. And this is why Isaiah needs to give us this vision God, as he looks out amongst his children, he loves them, he adores them, he wants to heal them, he wants to make them whole, he wants to give them the promise to which he's he's offered to them, but he needs them to understand in this first aspect of the problem, all of us have a tendency and a predisposition to forget who we are. Now, when we forget who we are, it's really interesting, by the time he comes to verse 11, I just want you to hear this so you can kind of, can feel this. The moment we forget who we are, I think the next step in this process of forgetting who we are is then we start to go down this path in which we kind of don't even care. It's just, we kind of just go through the motions. And so in verse 11, he says, what to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I've had enough of the burnt offerings of rams, of fat, of well-fed beasts. I don't delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who is required of you this trampling of my courts? 
Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon, Sabbath, and the calling of convocations. I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. Your new moons, your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They become a burden to me. I'm weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make, my, make uh, many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Yikes. What's going on? The moment we forget who we are, there's a predisposition and tendency then to start just going through the motions. Now, here's what's scary. Many of you, and I probably didn't because I knew what I was about ready to say, so I'm going to give myself kind of an out because I knew I was about ready to say this. How many of you entered and you just went through the motions this morning? Honestly. See, in this, this whole downward spiral, one of the ways in which we can know where we're at on that is if we're just going through the motions in this, this reality with God. And, and God doesn't choose just anything. He chooses the best of what was going on in Judah at that time. He chose this sacrificial system, this way in which God gave them a means to know him. God gave them the place to know him in the temple. He gave them everything in there. And what did these people end up doing? They took and they walked through the motions of things. They kept to the attitude of the law but God doesn't want our second best. He either wants everything or nothing. We just go through the motions. Now, we're not fully into maybe this idea of rebellion, but the way I would say it is it's the beginnings of rebellion. We're beginning to get this place into our life in which now, and I would say this, what comes in our next step, when you look at verse three, is he says this to them, the ox uh, knows its owner, the donkey its master's crib, look at this, but Israel does not know, my people do not understand. Well, let's think about this downward spiral. If the first aspect of the spiral is, is that we forget who we are and we forget the greatness of who God is, and the next aspect of it is that then we start to then just kind of go through the motions. We just kind of live as if God is just kind of there and we, 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 we kind of use him almost in some ways as a, as, a, as a get around to get what I really want in life. The next phase of it is, is that we don't, and here's the key word, know. Now the word know is so important. It's not no like facts. We tend to think of the word no like, you know, I understand that, uh, you know, in a, uh, a tri right triangle, A squared plus B squared equals C squared, you know, that's kind of the way we think about no. This no is completely different. Now, I don't equivocate this, but, but the idea of no was intimacy. They would sometimes talk about the, a, a man knew his wife in the Old Testament. They, in other words, there was intimacy to this. In this progression, the next kind of aspect of the spiral is, is we've lost intimacy. We don't even know each other anymore. My people don't even understand who I am. He's, he's, it's a cry at the end of a God looking at them going, I remember what it was like, especially when you get to like chapters or uh, books like Ezekiel or Jeremiah. God will, will lay out his heart and say, do you remember what it was like when we had this before you? You went your own way. It's just this cry of a heart of God. And again, I don't know where any of you are, but I promise you somewhere on this now spiral that I'm going to talk about, you will probably find yourself in some way. Why? Because I think this is the predisposition of humanity. The know that he's talking about here has an intimacy that's to be cherished and loved. It's an intimacy in which we don't just talk about anything or we don't just, we just don't just come in and slowly go through the motions of anything, but it is true intimacy. And man, once there's this loss of relationship, this spiral as it begins to tear off without even realizing it, and this is where I think I am many times and you are many times at this point, we don't even realize we're beginning to rebel against God. When you look up at this verse, this is what's so crazy about this verse. He says in there, even animals wouldn't do this. It's meant to shock them, like what? He's like, even the beasts wouldn't do this. They know who their master is. See, what is happening now in this progression, this downward spiral that's going on, that all of us, if we're not careful, can begin to go down, is that at this particular point, what he's saying in knowing God and having intimacy with God is that we've lost sight of who our true master is. 
This is what he's trying to convey. He said an ox understands his master, a donkey understands his master, but in a weird way, you don't even know who your master is anymore. Now, we don't kind of like that word, right? In our culture, we're like, ain't nobody my master. I'm the captain of my ship. You know what I'm talking about. No, everybody in here is mastered by something. Now, what's interesting about the people of Israel and this idea of mastery is it keeps moving on is that Israel and them would begin to trust, not in that one, but they would begin to trust them. When you look at chapters 7 through 12, they begin to trust in the Egyptians and the Syrians and the Assyrians. They, they begin to say in the back of their head that we would rather have intimacy with them. Why? Here's the key aspect, because they trusted in those people more than anything else. See, I see this maybe in our culture in this way. Let me, let me put it a little bit differently. We have a capacity and an ability to lose intimacy with God by beginning to trust in other things. We begin to trust in things like money, thinking money is going to save us. I mean, right now, I don't know if you've caught it, but the economy is hot, 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 hot. And it's just all over the place. And everybody's claiming the reason for why it's happened. Let me just tell you this. No economy happens to get hot, 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 apart from God choosing for it to get hot, hot, hot. But you know this very well. That economy can go like that. We trust in our political leaders. Oh my gosh, I don't know why we do. You know, we're going to be saved by whatever Democrat or we're going to be saved by Donald Trump. No, you're not. They don't save. Jesus saves. God is saying, what you're doing is, and this idea of pulling away from me is, as we pull away relationally, we begin to trust in that which we are building relationship with the most. And I would say this, whatever you're trusting the most is the thing that you're in relationship with the most. And now again, you're just seeing this downward spiral. Isaiah is just looking at him and begging them and calling them on behalf of God to come back from this. Now, what's so interesting about this is that he, he's showing them that the very, I would say it this way, essence of sin, the very reality of rebellion is a growing. And here's the word that he's going to show us in verse 4. He uses the idea of forsaken, and then he uses this word despised. To forsake literally means I'm going to find my hope in other things. That's what I was just kind of talking about. But here's this word despised. I want you to just catch this one. What it literally means is to grow in a distaste for. In other words, now, in this progression, what starts to happen to us is we lose an identity of the greatness of God and who he's called us to be. We lose our identity. After we lose our identity, we start to just go through the motions. After a while, then we lose any type of an intimacy and relationship. And then finally, we begin to get to this point in which we have lost all taste for God. The whole book of Psalms calls us, like it does in Psalm 34, taste and see that the Lord is what? Good. But when we lose our taste for God, we then begin to find our taste in other things. In fact, I love the way John Piper put it this way. He said, as we begin to do this, we lose childlike wonder and awe. They've died. The scenery and poetry and music of the majesty of God have dried up, and listen to this, like a forgotten peach at the back of the refrigerator. <laughs> now let's be honest for just a second. I have felt this way before. I have felt those moments where the grandness and the greatness of God is just something that I used to experience in my glory days in college. I felt that way before where the, the awe, the wonder, the scenery, the poetry, the music just kind of seems to be drifting in the background. And I think people have told me before, oh, it's just a dry spell. It's no big deal. Let me just tell you this. It is a big deal. It's all part of this progression that just moves itself along. And the lie of the evil one is to try to tell you that somehow, in some way, your loss and your taste that is no longer going towards God is no big deal. It's just a dry spell. But I've always found in my life and in other people's lives, when I lose my taste for God, I find my taste in something else. Always. So that's where we're at. It's just this spiral that keeps going. 
We forget his greatness and the greatness of what it means to be in him. We begin to settle for less. We go through the motions. It creates this relational distance between us. We, we kind of get bored. We then begin to find new loves. We, we find other things to draw our attraction. We go out there and find other masters. We find money. We find prestige. We find all kinds of different things out there to be our masters. And then in this whole progression, this downward spiral that's coming at us, Isaiah wants us to know what in the world happens by the time we get there. Now just catch what he's saying here in this whole spiral. And now some of you I know are sitting there going, oh my gosh, get to the good news. And I'm going to. But you got to understand this spiral because again, I'm going to ask you at the end of this, where are you potentially on this spiral? None of us are exempt from this. Now in this, he's going to give us two images in this downward spiral. The first one in verse 5, he says, why will you still be struck down? Why will you continue to rebel? The whole head is sick. The whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot, even to the head, there's no soundness in it, but bruises and sores and raw wounds. They're not pressed out or bound up or softened with oil. Now, what he's trying to get at here to help us to understand is that this man representing Judah, it could represent us, it could represent the church, it could represent anybody, is so beaten down into every square centimeter of his body, but the sad thing is he doesn't even know it. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen anybody like this that is so beaten up by sin that you can just tell as you look at them, they are just worn out, but yet in a weird way, they don't feel it. Those moments when a person comes in and just proverbially, they look like Rocky did after he fought Apollo Creed. He says, it's in here, this person, this is this spiral that starts to happen. And the weirdest thing in the world happens in this spiral is that they don't want to leave. It's like Stockholm syndrome or battered spouse syndrome. They sit there and they want to stay with that old master that keeps telling them it's going to be all right. But yet at the end of it, what's happening is is they're just getting battered and beat up over it all the time. Some of the most graphic ways to see this are within the drug community. Man, when you watch people that have abused drugs for long enough, they don't even realize it, but suddenly the very thing that they think is going to find them, bring them contentment and happiness and satisfaction, even though they know it won't, there's this weird thing that keeps drawing them back into it as the means to be able to survive, and they're getting the snot beat out of them the whole time. But it's not just that. I think the one thing that I would say, because probably most of you in here don't have drug problems, so let's just, let's be more personal. I think the one place I see this within the church the most is how busy we are. Walk up to anybody, how you doing? Nah, busy. Oh, really? Why are you so busy? Well, you know, the grind, the man, keeping the wife and kids fed, shoes on baby. You know what I'm saying. Keeping the boss happy. I got to get my kids to every single sport. I've got to somehow involve myself in everything and anything. And all the while, all that's happening is this idea of somehow fear of missing out, FOMO. I didn't even know what FOMO meant until about a year ago. In case you didn't know what FOMO is, fear of missing out, you know, because I'm a, I'm a loser that way, but that's where it's at. We have such a fear of missing out, but yet at the end of the day, as we go worship with the God of FOMO, we slowly and just radically begin to tear our lives apart. And then you know what the church sometimes does? And I think Cornerstone is just as guilty of any church. Then we find new ways also to keep you busy. Busy sometimes even doing things that don't advance the kingdom. All the while, God is looking at us going, Why? Why do we keep going after it? Why do we keep putting in 80 hours a week? Why do we keep trying to keep our kids in everything? I've told this story before, but let me just tell it to you again. I've watched way too many parents that have watched their kids commit suicide or go down terrible paths. All the while, they were trying to give their kid everything that they wanted in life, trying to make them happy, trying to provide for them this grand American dream. And at the very end of it, that grand American dream sneaks up on them, coddles them, draws them in, squashes them, and leaves them to nothing. Let me just tell you something. We do not raise our kids to enjoy 
destroy the American dream, we raise our kids to enjoy a much grander dream, the greatest dream of all of being those who are followers of Jesus Christ that are sons and daughters of the God Most High. There's too many people that are going to end up being great athletes and not even know and love God. They're going to play the cello nice and not even love God. This is where Isaiah is going. Now watch what he does next. He says in there now, here's the, here's the second to last place of what's going to happen in this spiral of sin. He says, your country lies desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. In your very presence, foreigners devour your land. It is desolate. It is overthrown by foreigners. And the daughter of Zion is left like a booth in a vineyard, like a lodge in a cucumber field, like a besieged city. In other words, this is the best way I can say it. You are a person or a people that are just a shell of what God intends you to be. You're just desolate. You're like a hut in the middle of a cucumber field that robbers have just come and stole all your cucumbers. It's just nothing. Now, isn't that peachy? Wow. Now, if you were to lay this out, now this is where I'm trying to get here. If before I began to then not understand the greatness of God. Before, I didn't understand the greatness of who God's intended us to be as his people. If I could ever go back to that point before I ever get to this point where I'm left hollowed out with nothing left, like that shack in the middle of a cucumber field that the robbers have just stole everything, don't you think then that the solution would have something to do with me finding and seeing the greatness of God and the greatness of who he's intending us to be as his people? Don't you think that that's the starting point. See, everybody always has in the back of their head, how do I get out of this mess? Once I finally have spiraled down there, what's the answer to this mess that I've found myself in? The answer is to go back to the very start and reacquaint ourselves with the greatness of God and the greatness with who he's called us to be. See, so often I, I could come in and I could, I, you know, I could beat everybody up, you know, and we could make everybody feel bad at the end of this, but I don't want you to miss this. In your week this week, the greatest thing that you can encounter is not just an ongoing reality of your sin. I hope today you do leave and you're going to sit down, and you're going to wrestle with your sin, and you're going to do what the solution we're going to talk about in a second is, is to repent and turn and go the other way and experience the greatness and the goodness and the graciousness of God who promises in Isaiah 61 to bind us all up and to make us whole, to heal us, because we have a gigantic God who now when we come to him repents, he doesn't look at us and go, it's about stinking time. Oh, no. It's the prodigal father. Remember that in the story of the prodigal son? When he returns, and I love the picture of this, the father sees him coming, and they had cloaks at that particular time. And in order to run as fast as he could, he pulled up his cloak, right? I mean, it's the best way I can say, imagine a woman doing it, unless, like, you're, I don't know, you wear a kilt or something. But just he pulls it up, and he's running to his son. So glad to see him. It says he fell on his neck, not to kill him, but he fell on him and loved him and adored him and lavished him. This is what Isaiah is going to give us the hope of. But there's one last step in all this that we got to get. See, in this whole progression, that the moment we start forgetting this, here's the final spot. The final spot we get to is we begin to be like Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, why in the world would he throw Sodom and Gomorrah in there? Because in all the places you could choose in all the Bible that was the worst, it was Sodom and Gomorrah. See, this is what I mean. Everything is moving this direction. Everything is piling. And if it doesn't get stopped, if God doesn't come in, and if the decision isn't made to turn and go the other way, the final outcome will be a Sodom and Gomorrah. And the whole sin of Sodom and Gomorrah wasn't just sexual sin. It wasn't the fact they were going to gang rape somebody. The whole reality was is that by the time we get to that point, we become so paranoid and so fearful that we begin to dehumanize other people and we begin to dehumanize other people people, you have now reached the epitome of what it means to fall away from God. 
It is what we talk about when we look about what happens to African Americans within the United States, the way we dehumanize those that are African American. It's what happened when we see with Hitler and how they dehumanize Jews. It's what happens even today when we kill babies that aren't even unborn. Why? Because the thing I've always found by the time we get to that point is that in some way, this thing is in the way of or the means of my safety, my comfort, my happiness, and I will do whatever it takes there, even bursting down a door to try to somehow how raped these angels that were in a man's room. That's what's kind of going on in this particular reality. That's the final outcome. You just don't even care about God and you don't care about people anymore. Now, before I give you the good news, where are you? Be honest for a second. Be honest. Have you lost sight of the greatness and grandness of God and the greatness and grandness of who he's called us to be as his kids? Are you at this point where maybe you're just kind of going through the motions of everything? You found yourself just kind of showing up for things and kind of going through just this reality and somehow hoping God will be pleased all the while at the back of your, your thinking that really, you know what, <clears throat> I know that I can settle for just less. I just don't even care anymore. Have you found yourself maybe creating this relation? You've seen this relational distance growing between you and God. Are you bored with God? Have you found new loves that entice you and intrigue you more than God? Are you even at the point now where I would say this, where you're so battered and bruised, you don't even realize it anymore, even to the point where when you watch different things or see different things, you don't even have a heart for people anymore. I mean, I sat out and I've done this before, but yesterday because of this, the convicting nature of not loving people, I sat out in front of my house just the other night and I looked at all the houses around me and to the stark reality deep within my gut I had to be honest with myself and say I didn't even love the people around me see what I mean how this can get there I don't care we just get there and the greatest thing in the world in this verse 9 I love this look at this if the Lord of hosts had not left us a few survivors. Gosh, I was meditating on that verse, Lord of hosts. We're going to see it in Isaiah 6, right? We've kind of already talked about it. Isaiah enters himself into the very throne room of God, right? And it's peals of thunder and it's, it's earthquakes, everything going on all around him that's crazy. And in the middle of all of it is the grand throne room of God himself sitting there in all of his glory and his greatness. And he is the Lord then of the multitude of hosts that right now are, in, walking, are, are flying around his throne proclaiming his greatness. Something must be greater than my sin, something must be greater than this downward spiral or we're always going to go that way. And I'm here to tell you, the Lord of hosts who sits in unapproachable light, who for those of you that know Jesus Christ, he is your father. He is the means and the only means of ever stopping this thing. And if you want to, you can actually today repent and turn around and come back to him and you will find grace, grace like you've never known. He's the Lord of hosts. He's the Lord of Simi Valley. He's the Lord over all things. He's the Lord over all the nations. I was sitting there at the gym the other day because obviously I don't lift. I sit and I pretend like it, right? And so I'm sitting there listening to two guys talk, you know, and it's the world falling apart and everything is going to happen. And, and finally, you know, one of the guys looks at me and goes, what do you think? And I go, I'm just so glad there's a God who sits on a throne who's in control of all things that tomorrow if he wanted to stop it, he could. And the guy looks at me and he goes, what God do you believe in? In the back of my head, I'm like, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Funny it's big. Right? He just circles right back around. You see this goes full circle? Comes back to the greatness of God. He comes back to the Lord of hosts, the Holy One of Israel. 
He comes back and tells us by the time we get to Isaiah 53, yes, you are like wandering sheep, all sheep that have gone astray. But the greatest news in the world is he sent the suffering servant to us to die for us, to create this pathway for us to come back to him because of the greatness of Jesus Christ, which we're going to talk about next week when we get to the solution. But don't miss this. Everything full circle comes back to our view and our vision of God and the greatness for who he is and who we are in light of him. And if today you don't know Jesus, let me just say this. This great God is not a God to be trifled with. Sodom and Gomorrah tried to trifle with him and he destroyed those cities with fire. But today is a phenomenal day if you don't know Jesus to come and to bend your knee to this Lord of hosts because he is awesome and he is terrible and he is not one that you want to find yourself in front of apart from Jesus Christ. But for those that know Jesus Christ when they stand before him one day, though he will be awesome and though he will be one who is beyond anything that we can imagine, but because you are in Jesus Christ, you one day will be able to stand in front of the great King, Jesus Christ, and he will transform Transform you today into the person that he intends you to be. Do not leave here today without bending your knee to that God. For the rest of us in here, I know I didn't get to the full solution. I actually intended to get there, but we're going to have to see that for next week. But I'll say it like I've always said it before, and I don't want you to ever get bored with it. Never forget who your God is. Never. Never forget who you are in light of him. And may this week, as you examine your heart and you look through maybe where you're at on that scale, may this be the week that you grand, you take a gaze back into the greatness and the goodness and the gloriousness and the graciousness of the king of the universe. And all God's people said, amen. Amen.